All right, well, welcome folks. Uh, this is Dr. Shane again, and this is our pre-lab video for the first week. So this is not the same as the introductory, introductory video, although all the information that's on the board is the same that you just saw there. So make sure before you come to lab, check D2L, make sure you bring a scientific calculator, work on getting a scanner or app to upload documents to D2L, know when you're supposed to arrive, mask, social, physical distancing, all of those things. And if you were sent information about the online safety course, go ahead and start that. Although when I made this video, we don't have that information. So our goals today in lab are really the last bullet point that's over on the left side. This is your pre-lab lecture for significant figures and scientific notation. Dr. McCann is not going to go over this material very much in lecture. So this is where you're going to learn this material. So this video might be a little longer than normal. And then if we uh, have a little time at the end of the video, I'll go over some of the safety features of the lab and then we will go from there. So I'm gonna come out from behind the uh, camera now and go ahead and get started. Oh, while I'm erasing the board, go on to D2L. There are four documents, four documents uh, on week one that you want to download and have them ready to look at while we do the pre-lab lecture or better yet, print them so that you have them before you come to lecture, okay? So get organized, get your calculator, get some notes uh, ready to go. And we are going to start here in a few minutes. So I'm going to come out from behind this. Maybe this is the first time you're seeing me. This is me. Uh, we'll go over some other stuff in a little bit. And Dr. Freely is also here in the uh, lab with me. I think he's going to head on out. He might say hello if he wants to. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, you may have a little bit of anxiety about chemistry, but believe me, uh, Dr. Shane and I have taught this so many times, and um, chemistry always appears to be harder than it really is. If uh, if it was hard, Dr. Shane nor I would be able to do it. So this, this is true. So um, have fun with this, and um, we'll see you later. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So now that Dr. Freely's going to head out, he can close the door if he would, please. Thank you. Then now there's nobody else in the room with me, so he can safely take off the mask. Yikes. It's going to be an interesting semester. Okay, so make sure you're organized. Uh, so there's a handout for significant figures which has the rules on it. There's a bunch of problems that we're going to work uh, in class, and this is what will be due next week. So it's not really a lab report, it's just a homework assignment. But take this very seriously. Dr. McCann's not doing this in lecture. Uh, then we'll have the equipment list. I don't know if you can see any of that. That we'll use to inventory your drawers and the laboratory safety rules. So there's four pieces of paper that we're going to need uh, for today. And make sure you do print those out. Don't bring them on a device. Uh, that would not be the best thing to do in the lab. Okay, so uh, the rules are there for a reason. The rules are there so that we know how to properly report scientific data. That's the point. Uh, I, when I've taught this lesson before, student, most students have seen significant figures in scientific notation, and it might seem a little boring. Well, it sort of is a little boring, but it's vital that you know how to report data properly. It's for some of you going into health professions or going to do anything quantitative, proper reporting of data is a legal and an ethical issue. So these rules really have, can have some serious consequences if they're not adhered to. So, um, it doesn't really matter the order that we go things, do things in here, and I'm not going to rewrite all of this. Okay? I'm just going to go over some basic stuff, and you'll quickly learn that I'm not rehearsing these and then doing them in a polished manner, okay? So, scientific notation. Yeah, I'm not uploading these and making a bunch of money selling a subscription to my YouTube channel, believe me. Okay, scientific notation is used when we have really big numbers or really small numbers, and it makes it more convenient to write those. And you'll learn about unit conversion, doing things like millimeters, kilometers, micrometers, nanometers. You'll, you'll learn that in lecture. So this is sort of a, an introduction to that. So and there are some examples here. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I can use lots of these. I'm just going just to make a few up. So say we have um, 
a number that's really, really small. This might be the size of an atom. I'm just going to make, make a number up. So say something is 0.000052 meters long. I, I don't know what that would be. That would probably be something like uh, a large biological molecule or something like that. This is really an inconvenient number to write. So what we do for scientific notation, we take the decimal place, we move it in between the first two non-zero digits, and then we use a power of 10 to indicate where the decimal place should be put to put it back in its original form. So this is called standard decimal notation. That's what that's called, standard decimal notation. This is called scientific or sometimes exponential notation. Okay, so in this case we put 5.2 times 10 and we move to the decimal place 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places. So we moved it 6 places. But to get the original number back, we have to move it 6 places to the left. So 5.2 times 10 to the minus 6 means we take the decimal place and move it 6 places to the left, and it's still the same units. Excellent. All right, let me show you uh, another example. Let's use an example at the other end of the spectrum, maybe a little less, maybe it's uh, 5,000 or 560,000. And I'm not going to put a decimal place there, just so you know, here there was a decimal place, you kind of had to have it. I'm not going to put a decimal place there, just remember that for later on, that makes, that'll make sense later. So 560,000, I, I guess that makes sense, maybe we're talking something that's used to measure something astronomically, so it's 560,000 miles away, I have no idea what that is, what that would be. All those zeros are fine, we need to know that they're there, but they're kind of a pain to, to write. Oh, by the way, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 6 meters is the same as 5.2 micrometers. You'll learn more about micro means 10 to the minus 6. That's just bonus learning right there. Uh, so 560,000. So the same rules apply. So we take the decimal place and we put it here. And we had to move the decimal place here, the decimal place would be here, so we had to move it one, two, three, four, five. But to get the original number back, we have to move it five places to the right. So one, two, three, four, five. That would work right. One, two, three, four, five. And we get the same value back. So that's scientific notation in a nutshell. I, I don't think it's all that hard. So the handout that you have. Excellent. Okay. Actually, I have some much better examples than the ones I just made up. Uh, the speed of light, the distance to the sun, the number of atoms uh, in 12 grams of carbon. Okay, I'm not going to read all of those on here. But those are some really good examples that we can go over in class. And then, yeah, you can actually jump and do the examples on here, too. Yeah, and I'm not going to go through all this. It tells you, is it going to be a positive or a negative exponent? You have to move it to the right or the left. Okay, so we can handle that, and I think that's probably enough. So that's scientific notation. And again, you'll learn how to uh, make this even easier by using the Greek prefixes like milli, centi, kilo, mega, micro, and then nano, which is 10 to the minus ninth, and even smaller. So you'll learn more about that in lecture. That's the preview of coming attractions. The other thing that we want to talk about here are sig figs, significant figures. Okay, so when you have a measurement, which ones of the numbers in that measurement tell you something about the sample that you have? That's a little bit strange way of saying it. So, what we have is a way of telling which digits should we be paying attention to. That's one way of putting it. Uh, and then when we do a calculation, how do we report the answer? What I tell students in every chemistry class that I teach is significant figures are there so that you report the answers properly and you report them based on the least precise piece of equipment. Your least precise piece of equipment 
governs the precision of your final answer. If you don't pay attention to significant figures, you're doing one of two things. You're either lying about your data, that it's better than it actually is, or you're selling yourself short and not reporting the data properly based on the equipment that you have. So these rules have, can have real consequences. Okay, so significant figures, the, the rules are here. I think where, where they go. Oh, sorry. The rules are all right here. So review them. I'm just going to give you a quick and dirty synopsis, and then we'll do a couple of examples, OK? So you look at a measurement. No? Here's two measurements right here. OK, so the rules for significant figures are this. If it's not a 0, it's significant, OK? Some instrument had to measure this 5 and this 2. So the 5 is significant, the 2 is significant. If it's not a 0, it's significant. The main thing are when, when are zeros significant and when are they not significant? OK. Well, let's do There's a bunch of cases where we can have a 0. So let's just look at those. The first case is, is the zero in between two non-zero digits? And I don't think I have an example of that over here. Well, let me just do one. Uh, let's say we have um, 5,006, and I'll put a couple more zeros, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make this one a complicated example. This is a ridiculous measurement. Let's call that uh, inches. I, mean, I, that's, I just made that up. So. If the zeros are in between two non-zeros, well, those are significant. Maybe that makes a lot of common sense. OK, well, where else do we have zeros? Well, these, sometimes we call these leading zeros. This is, this is probably the hardest one. Leading zeros. So the zeros that come at the beginning of a measurement before the actual non-zero digits. This one is tough. These are not significant. The reason I say it's tough is, well, if this was measured and this was measured, all of those zeros had to be measured. So why are they not significant? Well, the answer is, is these zeros don't really tell us much about the sample. The five and the two do. These zeros are just placeholders. Uh, ahead of this. That's why we put it into scientific notation and only show the significant digits. Okay, so those are, not, I'm going to go back through examples of all of these, by the way. So leading zeros are not significant. Okay, well, the zeros are either in between they're at the beginning or they're at the end. That's the only three places zeros can be. So sometimes we call the other ones trailing zeros. I have no idea what they're calling on here. That's fine. It's really the same thing. So we've got some examples here. We've got trailing zeros. We've got trailing zeros. They're at the end of the measurement. There's no non-zeros down here. But there's two very important distinctions. There's no decimal place here, and there is a decimal place here. If we put a decimal place, we are explicitly communicating that this zero, this zero, and everything else was measured. So if there is a decimal place, these are significant. And that includes if I have a bunch more zeros after this. If I have this decimal, and there's no decimals, we don't know if these were measured. These would not be significant. So trailing zeros with a decimal place. So with a decimal point, those are significant. If it's trailing zeros without a decimal place, those are not significant. And those are the rules for significant figures in brief. Non-zero, okay, let's, let's go through some examples. All right, uh, so this, this one right here. These are leading zeros. I already did this example. These are non-zeros. So this would have 
two sig figs. This is why scientific notation is so helpful. It's so helpful because um, we only write the digits that are significant. So we write 5.2 times 10 to the minus 6. We only write the significant digits. So two sig figs. This one. Five and the six are significant, but these zeros are not. These zeros are not significant. Okay, so this has also two sig figs, SF. Right, and then we put it in scientific notation, only showing those two. This one, again, is a ridiculous measurement. The five and the six are significant. This zero and this zero are significant. There's a decimal place. These are trailing zeros. Those two are significant. Everything is significant here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. This has six sig figs. We could put it in scientific notation. Let's see if we can figure it out. So stop the camera and put this one in scientific notation, showing all the sig figs, because that's what you do. So if I'm checking, so slip down. two non-zero digits. That's not exactly right. You put it after the first non-zero digit, regardless if this is a zero or not. That, that's, I think I made a mistake. There. That's okay. All right. So I think this is right. So if we're, you're going to write, we have to write all of these significant digits. So scientific notation is actually more work here. It probably wouldn't be that useful to do, but it's a good exercise. So one, two, three, four, five. We have to write all the significant digits, which again is a lot of work here, but that's exactly what you would have to do. And it's six sig figs. I want to point out something. Occasionally we have students that come into Gen Chem where they put something in scientific notation, they automatically only write something point something and then leave everything else off. I'm not sure where that comes from. Just make sure you put all the significant figures in scientific notation. I know sometimes in physics classes that I've taken in the past, they say, oh, just just write two sig figs, something point something times 10, and don't worry about anything else. Well, worry about it a little bit more here. And I think those are the rules. Um, i trying to think of anything else I could, could show you here as an example. Okay, uh, so you should be able to look at a measurement and identify how many sig figs it has based on these rules. You'll see more examples when you work with me or Dr. Freely in lab. Uh, you can ask lots of questions. And the next thing is calculations. So you, you multiply two numbers, you subtract two numbers. How do you do that? Okay. Uh, I'll just show you a couple of examples here. I'm going to erase all of this. everything actually. All right, I'll just tell you what the rules are. I'll write it down. So we need two things. You multiply and divide, which are inverse operations of one another. If you multiply two numbers, you divide, that doesn't matter. If you multiply any number of numbers, you divide any number of numbers, you write the answer with the least sig figs of the measurements that you put into the formula. For addition and subtraction, you report the answer to the least number of decimal places. That's it. So multiplication division is based on total sig figs, go with the least number of sig figs. Addition subtraction, go with the least number of decimal places. So I guess I should write that down. So if it's multiplication or well, for division, least number of sig figs, in the calculated answer. If it's addition, which sometimes can look like <laughs> multiplication, or subtraction, you go with the least number of decimal places. That is a key distinction to make. Um, 
And I'm not sure how many examples of this I want to do. But I think there's a bunch. Yeah, there's a bunch on here. And you know what? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead and do an example from uh, from next week's lab where we're calculating density. Okay, so we actually have uh, two different uh, measurements. Maybe this is getting a little bit too too out of the, the realm here. Okay, so let's do an example. I even have some stuff here. Yeah, here we go. All right, there's there's a hunk of aluminum, just aluminum metal. Uh, if we want to get the density of this, I'm, I'm just going to make up some numbers. So if you Google what's the density of aluminum, the answer we get is probably not going to be anywhere close. So if we want to get the density of this, well, okay. So density equals mass over volume. So we need to find the mass of the object and the volume of the object and then do the division. Okay, so the mass is typically measured in a lab in grams, abbreviated G. Volume, it's not very big. Typically we're going to do milliliters M, L, and milli, preview of coming attractions, is 10 to the negative third. Also sticking something else in here. A cubic centimeter, so a, a cube, that's a centimeter on each side. I don't have a cubic centimeter. Um, a die, like a roll, like a dice that you throw. Sometimes those things are about a cubic centimeter. Or you can just get a ruler out and look what a centimeter is. A cubic centimeter is the same thing as one millimeter. Again, just sneaking some information in on you here. All right, let's do a calculation. So typically what we do with an object is we put some water in a graduated cylinder, record the volume, drop this in the graduated cylinder, and the volume goes up, and we just subtract the two volumes, okay, <laughs> to get the volume of this. We, we can do the math and geometry of a cylinder, but we're not going to do that here. So that's called by water displacement. So, Let's come over here and let's let's do this. So we're going to do the volume of the aluminum cylinder, AL, just, just to give a little better practice here. Let's assume that you put this into a graduated cylinder. We're just going to do the math. It doesn't really matter. Um, and let's subtract these two numbers. Let's say that you put the graduated cylinder in there and the final volume is uh, 20. 0.21 milliliters, and the initial volume that you had in there was 17.50 milliliters. So, so what is this that we're doing here? So this is the water in the graduated cylinder before. You drop the aluminum cylinder in, the water goes up, and you just subtract the two. Okay, so let's actually make this a little bit harder. So let's say one lab partner records the volume before the, uh, just with water. And they record in their lab notebook or on a sheet, 17.5 mils. The other lab partner is a little bit more precise and records that decimal place. So this decimal place is not recorded, and this decimal place is. So we've got two measurements that don't look like they're really about the same, which is, it happens. Let's just go through the math here. So this is three sig figs in one decimal place. Okay, that zero is significant. This is four sig figs in two decimal places. It is a subtraction. So we have to report the answer to the least number of decimal places. So we're only going to report one decimal place here in this answer, which seems like it kind of sucks because we're going to lose something. Do. Okay, uh, I don't have my calculator on me just yet. I think this, hopefully, this calculator works. So subtract those two numbers. So 20.21 
minus 17.5, enter. Now my calculator gives me 2.71. Just reading my calculator says 2.71. That answer is wrong. It's right on the calculator, but it's wrong mathematically. Because this gives us two decimal places, which we cannot report. We cannot report uh, this answer that way. So we have to write 2.7 stop milliliters. And look what happened. So this answer is incorrect. That's the way you strike something out in the laboratory when it's incorrect. That has to do that. We can't do that. Which is wrong. But now, we only have two sig figs. We, went, we had four sig figs and three sig figs. Now we're down to two. Exactly. That's what happens in the lab. When you subtract two numbers that are kind of close together, you often lose significant figures because of this decimal place or because of the numbers out in front. So we would report this as 2.7, one decimal place. Awesome. Okay. Um, that's just an example. And mass is pretty straightforward. We don't calculate mass, typically. We just go to an electronic balance and record the mass. So I'm going to use kind of a dumb mass. Let's say you get, uh, well, actually, it's not a dumb mass. Our electronic balances go out to four decimal places. So let's uh, so assume that you go back to the electronic balance that the mass of the aluminum cylinder that you just measured was 5.0000, because our, our electronic balances can go out that far. That's a very strange number to get grams. Oh, by the way, uh, this would then also be 2.7 cubic centimeters. Typically for solid objects, we use cubic centimeters, and for liquid, like water, we use millimeters. So I'm just trading over from liquid water to a solid piece of aluminum here. Fine. Let's assume that. You just go back there. So how many sig figs is that? One, two, three, four, five. Five sig figs. Why are those zeros significant? They're trailing zeros. I erased the rules. They're trailing zeros, but there's a decimal place there. All of those are significant. Why would I write them down if they weren't? So again, that measurement's pretty tough to get. Okay, that's not a calculation. Let's actually calculate the density now. So density is mass, right? And mass in the numerator, which is grams. So 5.0000 grams divided by uh, volume, 2.0000. Cubic centimeter, so the units on density are going to be grams per cubic centimeter, kind of like miles per hour, so grams per cubic centimeter. And we've got one, two, three, four, five sig figs in the numerator, two sig figs in the denominator. And this is a, a division. So we're going to report our answer, whatever answer we get. It's going to have two sig figs, not decimal places. It's going to have two sig figs. And, and this sometimes is problematic for students because they say that's that's not the best answer. My calculator gives me more numbers than that, but that's that's fine. So it's not fine. Uh, your answer is limited by your least precise instrument, and this is a perfect way to show this. I don't know if I have some. Yeah, here we go. There's a graduated cylinder, so there's the initial volume. Plunk the plunk this in there, and it goes up. It's not that hard. Uh, this is not a very good instrument. An electronic balance, it's worth about twenty-five hundred dollars, is a better instrument, precision-wise, than a graduated cylinder. So our answer can only be as precise as this. It can't be as precise as the other. I'm pointing there because our electronic balances are back there. I'll show you later. So do the math and report the answer to two sig figs. This is not going to be anywhere close to aluminum. I just made up the data. 
So now when you put this on your calculator, you can just type in 5. And you can put 0.0000 if you want to. But the calculator doesn't care about that. Divided by 2.7. OK, I got 1.8518518852. That's a lot of repeating. OK, so that's. I got, all that, I got all those numbers, and I can only report two. Well, that's kind of a bummer. What are we going to do here? Because it's 1.85, and you're going to learn about when to round up and when to round down. I don't know if the rules are on there or not. I don't think so. Rounding. Well, we have to, we have to, we have to truncate it somehow. So this is 1.85. I'm going to round this up to one point. Nine grams per cubic centimeter. So we've got to figure out a way to take all that all that stuff off the calculator and apply our rules for sig figs, which most calculators do not do, and record our answer properly. This is a trivial example. It's not. It's not really that trivial of density. We're going to do more with density next week in lab, so I guess I did myself a favor by talking about this now. But the point is this. Your calculated answer can only be as good as your least precise instrument. I'm just, we're going to hammer that point. And the rules for significant figures are designed to reflect that. And as you do calculations, the error gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what's called propagation of error if you've had a statistic. Okay, um, I think that's it for the first activity. I just want to look at the problems that you're going to be expected to do. So scientific notation, significant figures, you're ready to go. Uh, okay, I'm going to come out from behind here and just, if there's still power left on the camera, hopefully there is. Good, there's still some power, we're still recording. I'm just going to show you some of the basic safety stuff in the lab and then we'll be good to go. So, pardon my now wearing this so we already talked about yeah we talked about that you'll get a face shield bring a bag with you because that's going to get all scratched up there's my backup mask um this is the this is the eye wash whoa hey so if you get something in your eye that'll do a pretty good job washing your eyes out uh let's see what else do you need to know fire extinguisher oh yeah traffic flow i think we're going to try to have you guys come in this front door and there's another door in the back you leave there as your classmates are coming in let's see you got a first aid kit break some glass oh yeah if you have broken glass that's kind of self-explanatory isn't it broken glass goes there not there because it's really dangerous for the custodians to throw away broken glass. So you'll hear all this later. So there and there. Uh, do you like my fancy tripod for the camera? Okay. Um, you'll learn about some of this equipment as we go along. Again, make sure you stand on a, uh, one of the X's or stickers. These fume hoods are here. If you ever have any piece of equipment that seems like it has an odor, put it in the fume hood. It takes the fumes away. It keeps the ventilation in the room. Let's see, I think I already showed you this. We have the sinks, that's fine. What other safety equipment do we want to show you? So the fume, oh yeah, uh, there's a safety shower. Believe me, if you, if you pull that ring, water, it doesn't look like it, but water will come out. So that's, we don't really typically deal with all high volume chemicals in here. So we haven't had to use that in a long time. I'm not sure we've ever used this one in here. All right, what else? Yeah, keeping the clutter down is the main thing. So don't like throw your backpack and your jackets on the bench. You wouldn't want to do that in a chemistry lab. Anyway, um, yeah, we're also going to talk about your personal safety. So your lab attire, closed toed shoes, right? No sandals, no flip flops, none of those mesh running shoes. Where the, that's actually probably the worst thing to wear in the lab with those mesh running shoes because the stuff goes through the shoe and then through your sock, it's on your foot. Now you've contaminated lots of stuff. And then long pants, okay, don't wear shorts. Don't go with that whole, is it, is it above or below the knee? Just have long pants and keep your hair tied back. Not an issue for me. 
And this is our electronic balance room, which is why I'm showing you this. Might as well show you now. Uh, the lab next door, we pulled out a bunch of balances and put them on their lab benches. We have a lot of labs in there, so we're going to keep this door closed. And I might as well show you, we have some brand new balances, so I haven't actually used these yet. Cool. Well, while I'm here... Alright, so this is an electronic balance. It goes to four decimal places. Neat. It's got these sliding glass doors so you can reach inside and weigh things. Air currents, air currents affect the mass measurement, so this keeps the air from impinging on the tray there and changing the mass. So that's just it's pretty obvious. I guess go gentle on these things. So you turn it on. Oh, okay, it gives some kind of crazy picture now. And it gives you, oh, I'm sorry. These new balances go to three decimal places. That's okay. We have some older balances that go to four, so we just have to adapt to that. My bad. And I'll show you this more later, because you basically uh, open these gently, put an object in here, or you put a container in, and then uh, hit the tear button, which is kind of cool. I'll show you that later. So you can hit this tear button and re-zeroes the balance. I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself here, but that's fine. Um, okay. So I think we're going to stop the video here. Again, you will not be taught sig figs in scientific notation in lecture. So please make sure that you use this opportunity to work on that material. And then for next week, check with your instructor when, when things are due. You'll submit the answers to those problems on sig figs in scientific notation uh, next week and uh, also take a quiz next week. So two things will be submitted next week, a quiz and the answers to what we are going to work on this week. Nice work, and we'll see you on campus. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.